Okay, let me get rid of that real quick. All right, so these are notes over Chapter 3, which is the English colonies in Section 4. Life in the colonies, English colonies. Okay, we have the colonial governments, which is going to be the English monarch had the ultimate authority over the colonies. And we have the Privy Council, and you understand what Privy means, whether you're actually... Um, need to know or not to know as privy to knowledge. This group of royal advisors who set English colonial policies. So we have colonial governors and legislatures. The governor and advisory council ran each of the colonial governments. Now there's three types that you need to know. You have the royal colonies, and when it says royal, they're talking about the monarch. That's why they call it a royal colony. Proprietary colonies is where basically the individuals of the colonies take care of the colony. And that's the, the colony's proprietors. And then if you have a charter, if you want to start a colony, the uh, people go to the king, right, because it's selected by the people and they ask to start a charter. So that'd be a brand new colony as well. Usually it starts out as a charter and then it will go to a royal or proprietary. Okay. If it goes to proprietary and they can't take care of it, then it goes right back to royal. Okay. Some colonies had representatives to make laws and set policies. Representatives served on assemblies. We have representatives today uh, with our uh, laws. So we have assemblies uh, passed laws that had to be approved by the following, an advisory council and the governor. We already know who the governor is actually appointed by. That would be the monarch. Virginia's assembly, this is the uh, first of its kind in North America. Now, it's established in 1619, which is a very important uh, time because that's going to be uh, Jamestown at that time in Virginia. And it's going to have the first um, slaves that actually come to that area. I believe there's about 19 slaves at that time that are going to be introduced into the Virginia's um, Jamestown population because of tobacco. So they're definitely something that <clears throat> we're not proud of whatsoever. And... That's been going on, especially for 2020. Um, this date is very important. The Council of State members selected the Advisory Council and London Company. Uh, this is the founders of the cult. Okay, so we have a company from London. Okay, um, and these are the founders of the colony. So that all made up into this one Council of State. House of Burgess is kind of interesting to study. These are members elected by the colonists. So they have a voice, the House of Burgesses. New England colonies were based um, around town meetings. Not everybody has a town meeting, which we actually will get into. And people talked about and decided uh, issues and local interests. That's what they do in a town meeting, i.e. Uh, paying for schools uh, because they didn't have taxes for schools at the time. Middle colonies, these have county meetings as well as town meetings. You don't see county meetings up here in the New Englands at all, but you do here because we're starting to talk about um, larger plantation, uh, some, some going on there, but they still have some towns. Now, the southern colonies, they're so spread out with their plantations, they don't have town meetings, just have the county meetings. Political change in England, which is 1686, King... Um, England's King James II forms the dominion of New England. That's an interesting word when you say dominion. <clears throat> Wanted to control, and that's what dominion is. And they have dominion over you. It has to do with the word control over the colonies. <clears throat> this is not farewell for the colonists whatsoever. Thought they had basically grown too independent. Okay. The colonists have been too independent. So they send on this guy, his name is Sir Edmund Andros, which is the royal governor, which is going to limit the power of the town meetings. Um, this is obviously disliked by the colonists. All right, so in yellow, this is extremely important. English Bill of Rights. 1689, Parliament passes the English Bill of Rights. What does it do? It reduces the power of the English monarch. And it increases the power of the parliament. So actually today, if you were in Great Britain, that would be their actual government, which is a uh, constitutional monarchy. So they have a constitution like us, but they also have a monarch 
the monarch actually doesn't perform any political duties. Uh, they're mostly ceremonial uh, because of their heritage and history. I didn't want to lose that. Dominion uh, colonies formed new assemblies and charters in order to have local issues decided at home. Okay, here in the colonies, not via the monarch. All right. So that's very important, the English Bill of Rights. <clears throat> Colonial courts uh, used to control local affairs, and that's very important when you hear the word local, because they're going to use it also down here, it usually reflected the beliefs of the local communities. So, like I said in class, if you are uh, in Indiana and you go to a different state, they're going to have different laws. Okay. Many laws of Massachusetts reflected Puritans' religious beliefs. They're Bible-based because they're Puritans. <clears throat> Obviously, they're going to be Bible-based. These laws set standard for the community conduct, um, protected individual freedoms. We have New York Weekly um, Journal publisher, which is by uh, John Peter Zinger. Now, this is going to be brought up in a bell ringer later on, and... <clears throat> This is brought up, this case. These articles are that are critical to the colonial governor, which is John Cosby at that time. Um, this individual, Zinger, is going to be arrested for libel. Uh, in other words, he's telling uh, lies, uh, unfalse truths. Uh, this is called slander. And the, so they have a lawyer who actually argues for John Zinger that he should be able to print anything that he wants as long as it's true. All right. That is what we have today. That is in the First Amendment, which is called freedom of the press. Uh, the jury said that the colonists should be able to actually have, allow their voice to voice their ideas openly, and they found Zinger not guilty. So that that's a very important court case right there. English trade laws, uh, earning money from trade which is a major reason for English interest in the colonies in the first place. Um, this is going to be practiced in mercantilism. Remember the root word mercantilism is merchant. If you're a merchant, um, or mercantilism, if you want to pronounce it that way also. <clears throat> so a way to gain power at the expense of other countries. Uh, limit. They also limit imports, which are products from other countries. They increase exports which are the products sold to other countries. So the mother country needs and they want to limit your imports and exports. Mercantilism, uh, supported by the Navigational Acts in 1650, 1696, which limit colonial trade. Remember, you can only trade goods with Great Britain. Uh, the Navigational Acts of 1660, the colonists could not uh, trade certain goods like sugar or cotton with any other country except for England. That's where you can't trade with France. You can't trade with Spain. Okay, so that's going to be sugar and cotton. Uh, must use English ships to transport the goods. The reason for that is because if you use your own ship, you may not go to the destination that they want you to go to. But if you're on an English ship, you're going to go where they want the goods to go. Um, the other navigation lacks required that all trade goods pass through English ports. Uh, they're going to be checking out basically what you're doing, but they're also going to charge you taxes, uh, duties, which we have today. Um, duties are import taxes that are added onto items that discourage people from importing. Uh, the biggest one on here would be China with, uh, with duties. And then we have England. Uh, with the Navigation Acts are good for the colonies. That's what they said. They are good for you. We don't agree here in the moment, but uh, this is what their, uh, England is saying about us. Uh, we are your steady market for good. So we're always going to have a market for you, and it's steady. But, you know, if you were to go to France or Spain, it's not going to possibly may or may not be a steady market of goods, but you're going to pay our price. So... The colonies had the Navigation Acts were not what we wanted whatsoever. This is what our um, reasons were. We want to, uh, to do business with whomever we basically uh, give us the best price. <clears throat> and that's, that's going to be capitalism. 
So um, got around them when this is what we do by smuggling and black market stuff here. We're smugglers. Uh, illegal trade. That's how we got around it. And what are we trading? Well, the things that we shouldn't be able to trade like sugar and cotton. Let's see if they, uh, so we got sugar. It's right there. Molasses. It's right, right there. We have rum um, brought in from non-English Caribbean islands. So that's what we're doing to get around things. England responded with a molasses act. They find out what we're doing because there's the molasses. Molasses Act 1733, which is going to be put a tax on those items because you're smuggling it in. They figure it out, so they're going to go ahead and tax us. Uh, but the law was rarely enforced on this Molasses Act whatsoever. Another restrictive act that was held was the Hat Act. This is very interesting. Um, it prohibited the sale of hats in the columns. I like to wear a hat, um, but this has to do also with what the hats are made out of. Required seven-year apprenticeship to become a hat maker. That's quite a while. Also, to make a hat, uh, to form it, they would actually go ahead and use mercury. If you ever heard of the Mad Hatter um, from a uh, certain children's tale uh, with a little bunny rabbit going down a hole, right? You're going to have this, right? I think that was Alice in Wonderland. Um, kind of a freaky little show. Um, I also passed because London felt that the makers wanted protection uh, from competition. Some merchants became wealthy as a result of the import and export of these goods like sugar and tobacco. Triangular trade, this is the definition, which is a system in which goods and slaves were traded among the Americas, Britain, and Africa. They left out the West Indies in there, but that could be so close to the Americas, but it technically is not. So this is usually how the colonies uh, traded with Great Britain in the Middle Passage. So millions of slaves came from Americas, came to the Americas via one leg of the triangular trade, and then could actually take as long as three months on the ship um, it is an individual who's never even been on a ship on the water. And it gets worse than that as well. So as many as possible jammed, they were talking about the actual Africans that are jammed into these onboard and uh, ships in order to save traders to maximize profits. There are diagrams that you can find of actually how they um, laid these individuals out. So many died along the way, of course, um, especially from disease such as smallpox. So it's a nasty business. Slaves became more valuable as indentured servants or used less frequently. Remember, indentured servants had about four to seven years because somebody actually would purchase their way to America. And to pay that off, they would have to actually be servitude for indentured servant for four to seven years. Uh, Vermont Constitution, 1777, first U.S. document to abolish slavery. Uh, the United States didn't end slavery until a century later after the Civil War, which would be in the 17th, late 1765. So there they are, um, about 90, 90 years, close to 90 years um, later, they actually abolished it. So um, Vermont already had the right idea. So they were the first one to actually abolish it. And this would be a, uh, important because this is actually during the Revolutionary War. So I find that pretty, pretty fascinating. Great Awakening and Enlightenment. So this is extremely important. That's why it's in yellow. Great Awakening definition is a religious movement that swept through the colonies in the 1730s and 1740s. Late 1730s, ministers began to hold revivals. These are emotional gatherings where people came together to hear sermons. They have this individual, as Jonathan Edwards, told sinners to seek forgiveness for their sins or face eternal punishment in hell. George Whitefield, excuse me, uh, emphasize personal religious experiences over official church rules. So more of a, a personal religious experience, okay, is what they're getting. And that, that key word is there, personal, then, then we're talking about the rules. Uh, ministers actually cross the county lines, which is a very, is very rare, okay, to exchange ideas with one another. So they stayed in their own colonies. Um, so one would stay in Virginia while the other one would stay in, let's say, New York or uh, Massachusetts or the other colonies. So they very rarely 
uh, cross the lines. Uh, ordinary church members, these are people from all walks of life, can actually play a role in services uh, in the church. So valued a place of uh, individual and also the notion that all people are spiritually equal, uh, which actually helped shape the political ideas about who should actually have a say in the government. Okay, so they're talking about equality. And that would actually have a play with these political ideas, okay, when it comes to um, who has a say in government. That could also be suffrage as well, which is uh, the ability to vote. The revivals, <clears throat> these were popular places uh, to talk about social and political issues. And people living in more um, restrictive colonies learned about uh, the more democratic system uh, used in other colonies because they're actually being social, okay, and sharing these uh, these ideas and, and uh, issues. So, because they were less restrictive. So, Enlightenment, the definition of the Enlightenment 1700s movement, which is a widespread of ideas of reason and logic, could actually improve society. Uh, this provided the ideas of how government should work. Some believe that there was a social contract, an unspoken agreement uh, to better each other between a government and its citizens. I, I think this is extremely important, especially today. That's why I went ahead and highlight that in blue. We have a philosopher, his name is John Locke. Uh, people have natural rights such as equality and liberty. Uh, Thomas Jefferson will borrow from John Locke. He's going to borrow a couple of words, if you don't, the Declaration of Independence, like the uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we talk about uh, equality and liberty, and that's who um, Thomas Jefferson borrows from is John Locke. Uh, this also influenced the uh, colonial leaders when we talk about the Enlightenment. French and Indian War. Uh, we have an individual, uh, Wampanega, which is a uh, leader of the Medicom. That's the leader, his name, uh, a.k.a. King Philip is what we're going to call him, who opposed New England's colonists. Uh, these attempts uh, to take native uh, lands is what's going on. So this happens in 1675. King Philip's war begins between the colonial militia. Militia are going to be civilian soldiers and the native warriors. <clears throat> so, it lasts uh, till 1776, and that's that's approximately what well, one year. Or so, over one year, we have 600 colonists and 3,000 natives, uh, including Medicom himself, are going to die in the Native American allies. Some natives actually join forces with the colonists against Medicom. So, we do look at natives fighting natives as well. That happened um, regularly. Uh, they wanted tools, weapons, and other European goods, things they couldn't manufacture themselves. Colonists wanted uh, other things that are of value, like furs. Okay, They're going to be sold overseas from natives to sell as a profit in Europe. These are actually going to go out of date, though, uh, European furs. And then that's where the fur trade just goes right down. <clears throat> now, we have the, um, the Algonquin. And the Huron, they trade and ally with the French colonists, while the Iroquois actually trade and ally with the British. So if you hear Algonquin or the Huron, that's going to be French. And then we have the Iroquois, that's going to be British. Most Native Americans viewed the French as a less threatening than the British. Uh, it's interesting to note that the French would actually they trade uh, closely with the natives, and they actually like take on customs, intermarry, um, have very close relationships with the natives. The British are not so um, as much uh, as what I've actually researched in uh, <clears throat> mingling with the natives as the French whatsoever. So the French settlements were smaller, okay? So they're not as a bigger threat than the British because the British are actually growing very rapidly, their settlements. So the natives can actually see this rapid growth and they're going to lose their land while the French are slow growing. Still, the natives protect their independence no matter whom um, they were actually friendlier with. So 
<clears throat> when it comes down to brass tacks, are going to protect them people over the French or the British. It, it doesn't matter. War erupts. We have the British colonists move into the Ohio River Valley, which uh, is where we are at at the moment in Delphi in the 1750s in order to take advantage of the fur trade. And you can find this out in Fort Wyotnon, which is just down the road there in West Lafayette. And I think it traded hands probably around 10, 11 times at Fort did. So uh, it's a very important trading post. French believe that this would hurt their fur trading profits and they built three forts to protect themselves against the British aggression. Fighting between the two sides began in 1753 as Britain took uh, look to take over the uh, the valley, and that valley is going to be the Ohio River Valley. So the British are going to take the whole thing. So they send in George Washington and his men defeated at Fort Necessity. We know that. Um, George Washington, who actually had basically started the entire uh, French and Indian War, he definitely aided that <clears throat> by killing that, that small French diplomatic uh Force is what they would actually say because of the word assassin was used in the articles capitulation that uh, George Washington actually did sign. Um, he will deny uh, that whatsoever uh, because he would say that he didn't know what he was signing. Uh, British colonial leaders uh, met in Albany, New York to discuss how to defend themselves. This is called the Albany Plan of Union. So we need to unite ourselves uh, suggestion to unite all the colonies as one instead of separate. Didn't go over so well. I believe this was Benjamin Franklin's idea. Doesn't say there, but I'm pretty sure that's Benjamin Franklin. It gets um, rejected because they still don't feel united whatsoever. They're divided colonies, not united. Uh, this is extremely important. The Treaty of Paris. 1759 is the turning point of the war takes place. The British General James Wolfe actually captures Quebec. 1763, the Treaty of Paris is signed by France and Great Britain. Great Britain gets the following. They get Canada. They get all of the lands east of the Mississippi River. Okay, except for New Orleans. They don't get that. They also get two little tiny islands basically in the Gulf. St. Lawrence, not a big deal there. Uh, more of a big deal, they actually get Florida, which is from Spain. Why do they get anything from Spain? Well, Spain actually sided with France in 1762. So they divide it into an East Florida and a West Florida. And Spain's going to actually take uh, Louisiana, which we will get eventually from the French, uh, land west of the Mississippi from France via an early treaty. Balance of power in North America shifts drastically towards Britain because of the, uh, the, the victory there, because they have all of Canada. They have pretty much half of the, the United States that we know of today. British settlers start to move west and claim these new lands. Uh, we can mark that down into almost like manifest destiny if you're actually talking about the United States. Western frontier, native leaders like Pontiac, uh, this chief opposed British settlements of newly acquired lands like, oh, the Virginia and Carolina backcountry. Now, if you're in the backcountry, um, that's that rural wilderness. So you're not very well educated whatsoever for the most part. Um, so this, this is definitely uh, out in the woods. That's why I call it the backcountry. <clears throat> so this is in the, also in the Ohio River Valley. And this is May 1763. Pontiac's Rebellion begins. His forces attack the British forts on the frontier, which is the edge of the settlements on the Ohio River Valley. So by June, Pontiac and his men destroy and capture seven forts in 1766. And this is three years. The rebellion was put down and Pontiac surrenders. King George III issues the proclamation of 1763. This is kind of like uh, being grounded. So wanted to avoid any further conflicts with the Native Americans and over eager settlers because they're taking the Native American lands. He's got to ban uh, the British settlements west of the Appalachian Mountains. So even if you are actually in the uh, Appalachian Mountains, like, well, not in them, but let's say west of the Appalachians, he's got to order you back, okay? order settlers to leave the upper Ohio River Valley and move to the east right of those appalachian mountains okay so those are your notes
That is chapter 3, section 4. Hope you went ahead and typed these out or written them out, and you can use these on the chapter 3 test. So we're going to stop this now and have a wonderful day.